On November 6, 2002, a fanfiction.net account was created, known as High Priestess Megami. Immediately after creation, High Priestess Megami would publish a story entitled Shinra High, based upon the immensely popular JRPG Final Fantasy VII. Shinra High was just one of 5,671 stories published for Final Fantasy VII at the time. Seemingly innocuous in the sea of writing, High Priestess Megami referred to her story as a novel and claimed she had been writing it for two years before publication. Shinra High ran for 59 chapters. While her chapters tended to be very short, the story itself is 78,000 words long. In chapter 43, Megami confirmed that the story would receive a sequel. Shinra High ended on June 7, 2004. On June 8th, Megami published the sequel, entitled Shinra Soldier, picking up exactly where Shinra High had left off. The stories are a perfect storm of tropes. They start an unsubtle self-insert, named Julia Nakahamao, an angsty goth teenager who is introduced, kicking open the double doors of the school out of boredom. Her tragic backstory begins with her father molesting her and forcing her into prostitution. After being put into the foster system, Julia begins her training at the Shinra Electric Power Company's high school. Luckily for her, she's inexplicably talented and in possession of powerful magic. She meets Sephiroth, the main villain of Final Fantasy VII, here reimagined as a dreamy by shonen love interest. Over the course of the story, Julia and Sephiroth would fall in love, get married, and have a child together. Eventually, they would become elite, first class members of Soldier, and leaders in the Shinra Wutai War. Under their leadership, they would instigate the genocide of the nation of Wutai. Despite this, Julia and Sephiroth are always presented as the heroes. The story fits into the high school alternate universe archetype of fanfiction. High school AU fanfics offer a simple and accessible premise that provides plenty of room for the author to branch off from the source material while staying faithful to it. Megami's description even stated that she had ignored characters' ages for the sake of story. Megami followed through on this promise, mixing around events and characters, such as the characters Yufi Kisaragi and Tifa Lockhart, here shown to be the same age as each other and already acquainted. In canon, Yuffie is five years younger and a country apart from Tifa before the start of the game. Despite the complete disregard for established canon, as the story evolved, Megami shifted her novels to serve as prequels leading up to the events of the game, forcing herself to kill off her original characters to maintain established canon. This culminated in the death of Julia Nakahamao and her baby daughter beginning Sephiroth's descent into darkness. Megami's personal life permeates every aspect of the story. She unsubtly inserted herself, her family, and her friends into the story, though insisted that the characters were unrepresentative of the real people they were named after. Megami demonstrates transparent biases in favor of characters like Yufi Kisiragi and against characters like Cloud Strife and Zack Fair, who she frequently humiliates. Her writing is littered with typos. Infamously, she continually used the wrong version of Zack when referring to Zack Fair, a mistake she corrected in Chapter 13. Megami's stories are conflicted in their portrayal of sexuality. She tends to eschew discussing it, and when it is brought up, it is presented in a negative light. Before their wedding, Sephiroth is forced by his father Hojo to rape and impregnate Julia, but after that, it is not until Julia and Sephiroth get married that they even sleep in the same bed together. Megami also takes offense to any character doubting Julia or Sephiroth's heterosexuality, such as when she added this scene to the remake of Shinra High. I called ya a lesbian. L-E-S-B-I-N, got it? Again, he offered that insanely irritating smirk. Grinding her teeth together, she ground out. And where would you have gotten that misinformation? Don't know, never met a straight girl that didn't go for me. He began clicking his pen, top up and down, as though he were to just ignore her. Listen up, Reno, she growled. I feel inclined to set the record straight here, only because your big mouth will blow such a lie way out of proportion. When he continued ignoring her, she grabbed his arm and dug her nose in. If you ever insinuate that my sexual preference is anything other than straight again, 
I'll tear your arms off. As an afterthought, she grinned and said, And as to why I don't go for you, well, I'd say you're a bit too feminine for my taste. Shinra Soldier concluded in 2006. In total, the duology would span 169 chapters and an epilogue. That April, she would launch the third part of her saga, Silent Melody. Compared to the massive scale of her previous works, Silent Melody only lasted four chapters. In January of 2008, she decided to rewrite Shinra High, as she had been unsatisfied with the quality of the finished story. The project did not last long, only covering nine chapters, 15% of the first novel. In both cases, it is assumed that the backlash towards her writing, or possibly a lack of motivation, caused her to drop the story, concluding the trilogy at 174 chapters. High Priestess Megami's bibliography included four other stories. None of her other work would garner the same level of notoriety as Shinra High or Soldier. By 2005, Shinra High and Soldier had received widespread attention, amassing 601 reviews. Their initial reception is unknown, as there is no longer a way to see all the reviews left on her story. Megami's author notes indicate that the reviews started off positively. But as time went on, they would receive large amounts of scorn from internet circles, becoming easy targets for mockery. High Priestess Megami was also an avid reader of other authors' works. In particular, she left reviews that were oddly defensive of who Sephiroth should be in a relationship with. As well written as this is, you should hurry up and kill the damn bitch! The fucking whore doesn't deserve to live! With that off my chest, a bit of constructive criticism. You are an amazing author, and I do love your writing style. Personal opinion though it may be, I believe your talents could be better directed towards other romantic pairings. Such as Cloud and Aerith, perhaps? In the game, I really did not see any textual evidence indicating that there was any sort of relationship between Sephiroth and anyone, let alone the pink-clad, violet-selling whore. Should you choose to write a story with a more sensible pairing, I promise I'll leave a nicer review. While the context of the fanfic is good, with a nice attention attention to detail, the concept of a Sephiroth slash Tifa pairing seems not only unnatural, but in essence impossible. Lord Sephiroth could never conceivably become involved with anyone of Avalanche. However, as a final critic, I do thank you for not being one of the scum out on the web who pair Lord Sephiroth with another male. Fewer things infuriate me more. Lastly, I do hope, I do hope, I do not sound like too much of an asshole. It is my personality, but I try to suppress it. One author who Megami had a run-in with recounted their experience on Tumblr, writing, Many a year ago, when the only fic I had going was my forever running Ereseth, I picked up a hater. She went by the name High Priestess Megami. Some of you already know the name. See, I had come across her fic about Sephiroth searching the halls for somebody named Julia, followed it for a bit, decided that homophobic obvious self-inserts weren't my thing, and removed it from my alert list. HBM took objection to that, it seems, and responded by leaving me a lengthy screeching flame about how disgusting it was I'd paired Sephiroth with Eris. I tried to ignore it, but as flames go, it was a doozy for my experience at the time. So late one night I began link surfing and quite a bit of googling and found her blog, uh, Blurdy. You know what I saw at that blog. You all know. High Priestess Megami soon became known for her aggressive attitude towards her critics. In response to a user reporting her story for content within her author's note, she wrote, Well, I can officially say that this week has been one of the more awful ones in my pathetic existence. Allow me to elaborate. I hate people. People are shallow, narrow-minded, stupid, and they insist upon forcing their opinions upon you. I went to post the next chapter of Shinra Soldier to find, to my dismay, that my account had been locked for some unknown reason. I learned, by checking my reviews, that some bitch had reported me to the fanfiction.net staff. She didn't like one of my author's notes because of the phrase, absolutely no yaoi will be accepted for this shrine. To assume that Lord Sephiroth is of such low moral standards is unfit of him and insulting to me. This was in reference to my announcement of the webpage that someone hacked offline about a month ago. Okay, now it must be stated that I have absolutely nothing wrong with gays slash lesbians. In fact, I know several who happen to be some of the nicest people that I know. 
Next, the only reason I find Yaoi involving Sephiroth insulting is because I happen to adore him. Would any sane woman want to see the one they loved with another guy? No, I think not! Spectators were less interested in Megami's writing, and more interested in Megami, the individual. Megami had made a name for herself, elsewhere, under another username, Sephiroth Slave. Her most infamous claim was that she had not only met, but married Sephiroth himself while visiting the Astral Plane. The combined negative attention towards her beliefs and writing culminated in an email that was later reposted and turned into a meme. Before you fire off another round of half-baked insults, allow me to assure you that you aren't to blame. In good conscience, I cannot place blame on those who have only room temperature IQ. All of it is really irrelevant, because Final Fantasy VII is a fictional work upon which I based a fictional interpretation. Your opinion is your right, and I really care less whether or not this changes anything. Finally, I have reached the main point of this letter, my beliefs. How dare you accuse me of insanity? How dare you accuse me of lying? I know what I say will be ignored and nothing I tell you will change your misguided opinion, but be warned. You are dealing with a far greater force than anything you have encountered before. Unleash your ignorant tongue and spew whatever mindless stupidity you contrive to force me to renounce my claim, for I shall never do so. The loss is yours, O oh foolish blasphemers, should you provoke me further. You have now been warned, and I feel no remorse for the metaphysical consequences there may be for further disturbances. Astral plane travel isn't the only paranormal practice I've mastered. High Priest Megami was, in reality, Julia Ann Zujutkowski niece, a teenage girl living in Stafford, Virginia. Her taste aligned with those of typical nerdy teenagers in the early 2000s. She played the flute in marching band, adored the heavy metal band Horn, and liked Sailor Moon. But above all else, she was a massive fan of Final Fantasy VII and had been on the internet discussing it since she was about 14 years old. Around 2003 and 2004, Julia, under the username Sephiroth Slave, would start an account on the now defunct journaling website Blurdy. She used it as a space to discuss her hobbies, mainly focusing on her exploration of metaphysical subjects. Julia was raised in a Catholic household and was the oldest child with three younger siblings. Early in her teenage years, Julia developed an interest in witchcraft and became an avid reader of Wiccan literature. She estimated that she had read hundreds, if not thousands of books on New Age subjects. Later, she would describe her beliefs as somewhere between a devout Catholic and a witch, and that neither group accepted her because of it. According to Julia, years prior, she had begun to have dreams of Sephiroth. When she confided in her psychiatrist about the dreams, the psychiatrist compared them to astral projection. This spurred Julia to research astral projecting, hoping she would master it. The oldest post archived on her blurdy is from June 2004, discussing a book she had recently purchased, so that she could learn to communicate with the dead. One of the things the prologue covered was motivations, and under the good motivations, it listed to communicate with a deceased loved one. Or words to that effect, anyway. So I ask myself, does this mean that, through the methods listed in this book, I can communicate with Sephiroth? It stands to reason that I can, because, in my beliefs, he had to die at the hands of the enemy before being promoted to the position of Archangel by the Lord God Almighty. So theoretically, he did die and therefore can be contacted, right? I certainly hope so. Well, I'm off to read more of that book, see if I can get through the introductory crap and into the actual methods. It was unclear from her blog where the line between fiction and reality began for Julia. Glimpses of her personal life were scattered about it, such as this post from August. Alright, to begin, these interests of mine. For the past five or so years, I have been victim to insufferable depression and suicidal tendencies, mostly because of Sephiroth, my soulmate. Crazy sounding, no? Julia truly believed that she was in contact with her soulmate. Sephiroth. She described Sephiroth as a cold and aloof individual, intensely jealous of other men, and nigh omnipotent. While he primarily wore black, he did not dress the same as in the game. 
primarily wearing dress shirts and jeans. Information about their wedding is inconsistent. Julia says she somehow acquired a wedding license for them in the year 2000. They got married, but their anniversary is listed as either June 14th or July 14th. They frequently met together on the astral plane and had established a telepathic link to keep in contact. It also apparently took four years of marriage for him to confess he loved her. Given the choice between her friends and family, or Sephiroth, she stated she would choose Sephiroth. In Final Fantasy VII, Sephiroth is established as unambiguously evil. Julia rejected this answer in favor of her own personal theory, entitled the Genova Possession Theory. In her eyes, Sephiroth was a brave soldier, who had been manipulated by the mad scientist Hojo, and then possessed by the ancient godlike alien Genova. From this viewpoint, she could easily dismiss events such as the Nibelheim incident, where Sephiroth massacred the entire population of a small town. It is in fact the other way around in Final Fantasy canon, which shows Sephiroth to have control over Genova. Julia's relationship with Sephiroth was affecting her social life. At 11.57pm on November 3rd, 2004, Julia's younger sister, Laurel, made a post on her own journal. Why am I always alone? Why does it seem like no one really cares how I feel? No one ever asks how I am or if I'm feeling alright. They seem to always care about how Julia feels. She's crazy. And when I inform her of that, she gives me the, even my psychiatrist believes me, why don't you? And I'm sick of it. I hate Final Fantasy and I hate Sephiroth. I want my old sister back. The one who never got mad at me or wore black or shunned the whole male race. I keep waiting for someone to notice, waiting for someone to ask if I'm okay, waiting for someone to give a damn about me because they care about me and want to help. Every night I say a prayer for my friends, that they are safe, and that they don't have to feel the kind of pain I feel every day. I doubt if any of them ever pays one thought to me, or offers one prayer up to the Lord for me. No one notices the cuts on my wrist, or if they do, they believe the bullshit story I give them. They don't really care. The knife I play with is one of my dearest real friends. It helps me feel the pain I need to make me realize I'm still living and must do so until God call me home. I just want to go home now. But I can't. There's something here that my Lord wants me to accomplish, and I will stay until I have done so. Laurel's post received unanimous support in the comments, from her friends offering support and kind words. Julia would not respond directly, until 11 days later, in a post entitled, Life is Shit. I've officially decided that I'd rather be in a coma than live my life. So far, I've discerned one person who doesn't take me for complete lunatic in matters regarding Sephiroth, and that's Sammy. I repeat, one person out of God only knows how many friends. Okay, so what? So I have really shitty friends who don't believe my honest to God words. Oh well, my own fucking sister doesn't believe me. Why should anyone else? Okay, I was wrong. There's two people who believe me. Sammy and my goddamned psychiatrist. Tell me, those of you who care, why would my psychiatrist believe me if my friends don't? Could it be because the psychiatrist is experienced in knowing when a person is lying and therefore knows when I'm telling the truth? Next point. Laurel, the sister you want back doesn't exist. I've always been this way, since the day that I was born and until the day I die. So that random girl that you want back is not coming back. You don't like it? Too damn bad! Disown me and go find yourself a better sister. Continuing right along. Sam! I'm not getting over Sephiroth any goddamn time soon. He's my soulmate, and he's one of the only fucking people in this universe that cares about me. In Laurel's most recent blurty, you said that religion was a crutch for people. Well, that means that God doesn't exist, right? So who can I rely on? Oh, wait, I know the answer to that one. Sammy, who at least believes me, and Sephiroth, who at least loves me. Before anyone asks, no, I'm not mad at Sammy. On the other hand, I am very mad at the rest of you. So go, flock to Laurel's side and take care of her. Make sure she doesn't kill herself, because I'm not going to do anything to interfere. She didn't care all that time ago when I used to cut myself, so it's only fair that I turn a blind eye to her when she's in pain. She's probably just doing this to get attention anyway. 
In 2004, Julia was preparing to travel to Otakon with several of her friends, causing conflicts with her dad. She took to Blurdy to air her grievances. First, I found out that my dear father doesn't want me to go to Otakon this weekend. He says I'm too unstable psychologically to be going out in public. He treats me like a complete lunatic, then wonders why I hung up on him! Third, my psychiatrist got the result of the blood test back today, and it's not good. She says there's a severe problem in my thyroid, which can mean one of two things. More pills or surgery. I don't want to have surgery! God damn it, I have enough problems as it is! And uh, I'm scared. I watch things like trauma, life in the ER, and impact, and I see people dying on the surgical table all the time. Maybe this is how God is going to answer my prayer for death? Now that it comes down to it, I don't think I like his method of choice. Lol. Later. Julia ended up attending Otakon in Maryland, a trip she documented on her blurdy, noting she was trying to find an individual named Vince. Vince lived in Maryland, and Julia lived in Virginia, so the two would meet up at conventions when they could. A blurdy from one of Julia's acquaintances, known as Weasel on a Stick, asserted that Julia and Vince were in a relationship. Weasel on a Stick says that Vince was a great guy and that he was completely fine with their relationship, Despite Vince being 23 and Julia being 16, Weasel on a Stick's assertion is nothing more than conjecture. By Julia's account, Vince had never even flirted with her. Unlike Weasel on a Stick, whose advances had been rejected by Julia during the convention where Weasel on a Stick had met Vince. After being rejected by her, Weasel on a Stick began to date Julia's sister Laurel. A month after his rejection, he made a 17-point list of grievances he had with Julia, believing she had led him on. Vince remained one of Julia's only male friends for years. In December of 2004, Julia opened up a DeviantArt account. DeviantArt would quickly replace Blurdy as her primary journal. She also posted both personal art and art she made for her classes. Her primary medium was colored pencils, with heavy use of pinks and purples. Her art is filled with surface-level religious symbolism, angelic figures comprising most of her portfolio. Most of her captions were little blurbs describing her thought process, but drawings that depicted her character, Julia Nakahamao, were accompanied by original writing. These stories focused on Julia Nakahamao's relationship with the character of Sephiroth, and featured themes of submissiveness and obedience. 2005 would come and go, and in 2006, Julia became a freshman in college. She originally studied musical theater, but would later shift her focus to video game development. In 2006, she founded a website that she had been working on for at least a year. The Realm of the Guardian, a haven for followers of the One-Winged Angel. Here she would post fanfiction and essays. Only a single essay has survived, in which she uses Catholic imagery and Sephiroth's appearance in the Kingdom Hearts series to exonerate Sephiroth and prove that Cloud Strife is evil. At this point, Julia's online persona was surrounded by her friends and associates. In the coming years, she would be followed by a group of individuals hostile towards her and her beliefs. On February 12th, 2007. Following advice from her friend, Julia made a post entitled, Necessary Documentation. She listed two users who had posted comments on her DeviantArt that she took offense to, advising them to stop or she would report them. One genuine commenter replied, I'm sorry, but this is the kind of dumb shit that'll get you on ED. This is the internet, a place where you can get noticed and practically worshipped or laughed at for stupid stuff. Of course you get flamed a lot. You were in love with a fictional character. People like that usually get flamed. It appears that Sephiroth's slave might have been featured on Ebom's world, as one commenter reposted a copypasta 53 times, signing it Ebom's world. In mid-2007, an internet user known as Iscariot created a page on Encyclopedia Dramatica, documenting Julia and her antics. This action, more than anything else that preceded it, led Sephiroth's slave to garner a minor cult following in the online sphere. 
her DeviantArt alone would receive 10,000 hits. Trolls inspired by Encyclopedia Dramatica would flock to her profiles. The most common kind of trolling was short, hateful quips, usually insulting her intelligence, her appearance, or calling her crazy. You're a bad person, and you should feel bad. What exactly makes me a bad person? I'm considered a helpful pillar of my community who will break her back to help anyone in need. I'd love to hear your half-baked argument. After all, I always seek to learn. Shut up! Your bitchiness and narcissism has been apparent since your donkey face showed up on the internet. Stop playing dumb. Hey, I heard you were a delusional fat <laughs> The fact that you think an entirely fictional character is real is a little stupid. I mean, in a way, you're raping the character that the creators of Final Fantasy put so much hard work in. That, and you do realize if Sephiroth were real, he'd stab you as soon as look at you, right? You are definitely hallucinating. Perhaps these gay-tarded hallucinations of gay video game characters are symptoms of AIDS, cancer, herpes, being fucktarded, too many dicks. You are a failure at life. Go kill yourself, bitch. Another common type of trolling involved the troll pretending to either be in contact with or in love with Sephiroth or any other fictional character. Julia never responded to any of these. Some individuals would attempt to have a conversation with her. XD. They'll stop if you just ignore them, you know. Flexing the muscle words of your vocabulary and lecturing them only makes them laugh. Roll their eyes, screen cap, and run back to ED. Just hide comments you don't like. Reply in notes to personal questions you want to answer. And keep your front page lighthearted. And they'll give you a break. Trust me on this. I'm an ED writer myself. And I've had a few articles fall on their face just because the person they were about didn't care at all, and perhaps be a little more cautious about what you publicly claim? It's a little late to be cautious about what I publicly claim, don't you think, XD? I dug myself a hole when I was younger, but I'm working my way out. Thank you for your advice, I do appreciate it, but ignoring my trolls doesn't appear to work well. Julia was rarely afraid to give trolls attention, which in turn attracted more trolls. It all reached a peak when Julia wrote on her DeviantArt blog about an altercation resulting from her online infamy. As of earlier this week, it's come to my attention that my reputation has officially hit rock bottom. So here's the story. A friend of mine and I were browsing through the mall, being fangirls, admiring wall scrolls, talking FF7. Anyway, we stopped into one of the comic stores and were continuing our conversation when we were approached by two guys where we're also fans and overheard our discussion. My friend started talking to them, and she apparently missed the memo about not making it public that I wrote Shinra High and Shinra Soldier. See, we actually met because she read my work online, and eventually she met me through a few of our mutual friends who knew I was the authoress of the two aforementioned works. And while it isn't the first time I've met a fan, this meeting in the comic book store marked my first meeting with the sad little people on the internet who would like nothing more than to see me get hit by a bus slash electrocuted by my toaster slash killed by a sniper. And the situation escalated pretty fast after my friend told them who I was as far as my internet self. They put together that I was the infamous Sephiroth slave, and before I knew what was happening in between futile attempts to verbally defend myself, we were going at it. The bigger the two guys lunged at me, and rather than standing there and getting pummeled, I engaged. I've been well trained in martial arts, so I simply grabbed the front of his shirt and drove my knee into his balls. I'm pleased to say I doubt he'll ever be able to father children, and he went down. The comic store worker, my friend, and his friend were standing there in shock and horror, so I told her I'd see her later and asked her to remember in the future that there are people who don't like me on the internet and thus don't like me in person. After that, I took off and laid rubber out of the parking lot. All I have to say about this in retrospect is that I'm glad I invested in martial arts lessons for the past few years, because it wouldn't do to spoil my reputation as a badass bitch and lose a fight. Since I've finally been found by people who would happily strangle the life out of me, I fear I may be fighting a lot more now. Aside from that, I thought it was an amusing encounter. In later comments, she would elaborate that she had studied Ryu Kyu Kempo and Taekwondo, and that the attack had been over her religious beliefs. After pulling on her deviant art, Julia decided to reopen her blurdy that October. She reworked her blurdy into what she described as a sort of autobiography. 
devoting it to in-depth explanations of her beliefs. Here Julia gave specifics regarding the practice of astral projection. She entered the astral realm by performing a deep space trance. As she explained it, the astral realm was just one of seven non-physical dimensions, or layers, that surrounded our physical world. All layers operated on different timetables. Of the seven layers, the one where she visited Sephiroth was the closest to ours, located in between Earth and Heaven. At this time, she made one of her most infamous posts. Only the foolish believe suffering is just wages for being different. The Cheshire Cat, American McGee's Alice. In recent months, I've become increasingly aware of just how disliked I am on the internet, mostly to my amusement. But I can say the amusement tapered for me after I was publicly, physically attacked for my beliefs. Following a brief Google search to get an idea of what most everyone thinks of me, I found that I'm hated on hundreds of websites, mocked in English, Spanish, French, and German, become somewhat of a household name for FF7 fans, and can make no move without the information ending up plastered all over my page on Encyclopedia Dramatica. I am this Sephiroth slave. Even though I've long accepted that my life will never be an easy one, I've decided to make an attempt at clearing up the mess that has occurred because my younger self failed miserably in establishing the boundaries of where the FF7 fan ends and the practitioner in the art of astral projection begins. Almost no one ever realizes that I have two different internet personas. One, who is the FF7 fan, who debates, writes fanfiction, and draws fan art. The other, who is addressing all who read this here. A normal woman working her way through college, working, living on her own, and loving the independence of being away from my family and starting my own life. In this first entry, I will try to explain why I am different than the hundreds of psychotic fangirls running around the internet, popping up on forums, screaming, I am Sephiroth's wife, me, only me. I am not like them in any way. You see, Final Fantasy VII and the characters therein are fictional. They don't exist. As most of you who read this will have missed the newsflash that I'm aware of this, allow me to elaborate. None of the characters of FF7 are real. None of them. Yes, even including Sephiroth. Back when I first started spontaneously projecting, I didn't know what I was doing. I thought I was dreaming and nothing more, even though there were major differences in those dreams than in the other dreams I had. 1. They were crystal clear after I woke up and didn't fade. I remembered each as though it had happened in my daily life. 2. Each was consecutive to the last, i.e. they picked up from where the last left off. And it was in these dreams that I encountered the Archangel Sephiroth. I was being granted the only thing I truly wanted, the one thing I couldn't live without. I was with him. Now I suppose I'll delve back and explain why I believe this occurred when it did. Before I began to project, I was in a bad state. I had fallen in love with the character, but knew I would never be with him and that combined knowledge was destroying me. I got into a lot of bad habits, not the least of which being cutting myself and overdosing on various over-the-counter painkillers. If the Archangel hadn't come to me, I wouldn't be here writing this. I would be dead. The physical body's will to survive had overpowered the mind's desire to die, and it was that which allowed me to project, to be with Sephiroth, my guardian angel, my spirit guide, and yes, my husband. Now here's the next bit of information that people tend to mess up when they're dealing with me. The Archangel Sephiroth bears the name and appearance of the video game character, or rather, the character bears his name and appearance, but they are otherwise unrelated. The Archangel I am wed to is not the video game character. I hope that clears things up a little. I truly believe my words will be better received if I can properly clear up the impressive mess my younger self made when she mistakenly believed that no one would care what she wrote on her little online journal if they didn't personally know her. Of note from this blurty is this line. In this first entry, I will try to explain why I am different than the hundreds of psychotic fangirls running around the internet, popping up on forums screaming, I am Sephiroth's wife, me, only me. As unlikely as it seems, she was not making this up. Julia seemed to have become aware of Australian cosplayer and internet personality Summoner Yuna, likely through Encyclopedia Dramatica. Summoner Yuna, otherwise known as Christine or Mrs. Sephiroth, had founded AdventChildren.net in the lead-up to the release of the 2005 film Final Fantasy VII Advent Children. Encyclopedia Dramatica was drawn to this site for its eccentric cast of users and frequent drama. Summoner Yuna was noteworthy because she had professed herself to be 
Sephiroth's eternal love. She was also a leader in the Sephiism movement, an attempt to found a religion around Sephiroth. It garnered a few dozen followers. Sephiism had advertised itself as a parody religion, but feelings seemed to deviate from member to member. Summer no Yuna never seemed to treat Sephiism as satire. The key difference between Summer no Yuna and Julia is that Yuna's love for Sephiroth leaned towards peculiar roleplay and not towards spiritual practice. In 2004, Yuna stated on her blog, Secondly, yes, I know he's a character. I wish he was more than that. But sadly for me, that ain't going to happen. But who does it hurt to have hope? Even if it's a false hope that will never happen. Although that hope has brought me much sadness, it has also brought me much happiness in my life. I was a goddamn wreck after my last real life relationship, and it was my love for Sephiroth that actually helped me get out of that hole I was in and begin to live my life again. It was after that very hurtful relationship that I vowed to never love in real life again, but also I'm a person who for some reason feels that they must love. And for me, the ideal situation is to love someone such as Sephiroth. And although I feel deeply for him, I do know the difference between fantasy and reality, even if some of you reading this may not think it. I live a normal life, work, go out, etc. I don't go around plotting to destroy the planet with Meteor because Sephi does it, or looking to murder people from large corporations. Those are the people you should be saying something to. Those that believe things so much that they'd actually try to do harm to someone because of their feelings. In April, Sephiroth's slave joined AdventChildren.net's forums, rumored to be an attempt to investigate Summoner Yuna. However, the two never publicly interacted, though unsourced quotes on Encyclopedia Dramatica state that Julia dismissed Summoner Yuna as delusional. It is not uncommon for modern discussion to conflate Sephiroth's slave and Summer no Yuna, often mistaking details about one for the other. Julia remained fiercely protective of her marriage to Sephiroth. Responding to a comment under one of her DeviantArt posts, she would tout supposed proof of their union. Shockingly, I have quite a bit of evidence to back up my claims. Unusual, seeing as now every psychotic fangirl claiming to be with Seph doesn't, People have accused me of hallucinating, or dreaming, whichever you prefer. But the fact of the matter is that I'm on the medical cocktail from hell. Among the medications I have to take for my depression and thyroid disorder are antipsychotics. Bottom line, if I were hallucinating before I was on meds, when I started taking them, the hallucinations would have stopped. My beliefs have been evolving for years based on new information I turn up on my gift and my own personal experiences. To this day, I revise my beliefs regularly. I imagine I'll keep studying and trying to understand as long as I live. For that reason, I tend to go off on people like Sephiroth's wife periodically. They, being she and all the others, may very well be in love with Sephiroth, but they are in love with a video game character who does not exist. I don't care if they run around the internet proclaiming, I am Sephiroth's wife, me, only me. Honestly, it's quite juvenile. Her increasing notoriety led Julia to do an interview on the website Enchanted Subcultures. Enchanted Subcultures was a website documenting phenomena such as soul bonders and other kin. Though identified only as Amanda, it was obvious who they were talking about. It would not be a stretch to say that Amanda, a young, talented model with flowing gold hair, could attract any gentleman whose attention she might want. But alas, young men, her heart already belongs to someone. Amanda is rarely afraid to discuss her unconventional relationship around sympathetic ears. She acknowledges that she is missing out on many of the things that normal couples do together, but feels that the strength of her love makes up for this. I am aware that I'll never have the physical bond that conventional couples have. I'm aware that I may be alone in the physical world, but I'll always have Sephiroth. Amanda would tell you that she is married to Sephiroth. She says that though he does not exist physically in our world, he exists spiritually. Amanda says that within her mind's eye, she can see Sephiroth and speak to him. Enchanted Subcultures labels Amanda as a soul bonder, but notes that she instead sees her and Sephiroth as soulmates. Soul bonding is a confusing practice to wrap your head around if you are on the outside, but broken down to its most basic components, soul bonding is a mental link between a real person and a fictional character. But like most spiritual beliefs, it is up to personal interpretation. Most soul bonders seem to see it more as a relationship than a set of practices. 
Sephiroth's slave would openly refute the label of Soulbonder on her blurdy, while confirming herself to be Amanda. This is my clarification. I don't mind lending my expert opinion to the side of the soul bonding community, since I have an open mind to all possibilities and hope no one ever has to survive my level of torment from my beliefs. But I am not a soul bonder. I am a projector, and there is a great difference. In November, she made a post to dismiss, common speculation that she was either psychotic or schizophrenic. She cited a WebMD quote, focusing upon the social withdrawal associated with schizophrenia arguing that she was too interested in the outside world to be schizophrenic. I'm a full-time college student, I'm on the karate team, and I'm on call 24-7 for my modeling job, which, it so happens, involves working with people to an almost annoying extent. I run this website and I'm active on many others, in addition to corresponding with many, many people who have written me privately to discuss my claims. I'll not lie and say I necessarily like people, so to speak, but that's more because their pettiness and shallowness is irritating to me and that holds true of the majority of people in this world. However, I love my life. Back when I was first diagnosed with bipolar, I read up on a lot of mental illnesses, trying to understand as much as I could to speed my treatment. Working with my psychiatrist, it became clear I wasn't bipolar, but suffered from severe depression complicated by a thyroid disorder. In October, during an otherwise standard blurdy, she opened up about her attachment to Sephiroth and the origin of her username. The most significant reason I believe he is near me on the physical world came about a year and a half ago or so, when I was driving home from school. My younger sister was in the car with me and I had a terrible migraine. As I went to turn the corner, I blacked out, and my car ran off the road and I hit an adopt a highway sign and a fairly large pine tree. My sister says she was screaming at me to hit the brake, but I never heard her or the sound of my car hitting the sign or the tree. And yet, despite all that, somehow the car stopped before I struck a solid wooden fence something that would have surely hurt or killed us both. As I came to again, I was going to just put the car in reverse and get back on the road, and my sister said, don't back up. Why? I asked. Because you're on top of a tree. I looked out by opening my door slightly, and lo and behold, I was indeed on top of a tree. Eventually, I was able to leave the scene, and miraculously, I was unharmed, my sister was unharmed, and to go even further, my car was unharmed. The only casualty of the accident was the poor tree. The only damage done to my car was a scrape and light dent near the front passenger tire where I had hit the sign. When I reflected on this accident later, I could only conclude that Sephiroth had been watching over me again, and for the second time had saved my life, or at least spared me terrible injury. So now I'll hit on my alias, Sephiroth Slave. This name wasn't fashioned to be anything suggestive or kinky or anything of the sort. It was fashioned in homage to how much I love him. Quite literally, I owe my life to him and will be forever indebted to him. When people use cheap imitations of my name, it is rather offensive, because this name I fashioned for myself is meant to communicate my debt, that I will gladly be his for the rest of eternity. A semi-frequent occurrence on Julia's blurty was question and answer sessions, during which she would attempt to clarify her beliefs. She garnered a cast of regular commenters, one of whom was named Lady Bo. Lady Bo would recount their experiences on LiveJournal in 2013, writing, I became pen pals with her. I told her up front that I didn't slash couldn't buy her beliefs, but that I was willing to listen and give her respect. I had read so many hate messages that were outrageously aggressive that I wanted to tell her that she didn't deserve it. Even though I told her I was a skeptic, I never really disclosed the fact that I mainly was in contact with her to draw out the complex web of lies with which she had deluded her existence. Despite the entries which expressed this relationship as a purely positive, life-changing, and life-saving, she writes about having breakdowns, too. She says she sometimes can't find the point in living her physical life, and prefers the comfort and substitute family she's found in her spirit guides on the other side. In her heart, I don't know if she can even admit to herself that these things aren't happening. I don't think it makes her crazy. I think she's an extremely depressed and alienated person, who believes she needs to embellish her life in order to get through it. A question and answer from March gave, to date, the most substantial insight into Julia's relationship with Sephiroth. What kind of things about him annoy you? And what about you annoys him? One of my biggest pet peeves about him is that he will randomly become unavailable for a week, ten days, two weeks, whatever, doing something he can't tell me anything about. 
It's unfair of me, certainly, but I wish he could tell me at least what he's doing while he can't come to see me. As for what annoys me about him, I'd have to say probably that he expects some things of me, such as his opinion that I should practically belong to him, that I won't bend to. Has he ever said slash thought anything that really hurts your feelings? There is one thing in particular that really hurts me in regards to what he says slash does. After all the years we've been together, he still doesn't trust me completely whenever I happen to be spending a lot of time with one of my male friends. It seems like he automatically assumes that I'm attracted to this guy and gets irritated. Ever been in a huge fight? Yes. Regarding a friend of mine I had in high school, he had a huge crush on me, and I felt sorry for him, so I consented to go to homecoming with him as a one-time thing. That incident was nearly the end of my relationship with Sephiroth. Past that, not really. I feel like a wimp for admitting this, but I make an effort to not do the things that would annoy him. Does Sephiroth display abilities on the astral plane that you consider superior to yours? Seph is pretty much better at everything, XD. He's the superior fighter by a lot, he knows the area around our condo backward and forward, whereas I would be totally lost without him, etc. I learn a lot from him because he's a lot smarter than I am. In fact, there are a lot of times I felt downright stupid next to him. But even though he has so many advantages over me, he's always patient enough to help me out. The only area I think I have him beat is in my ability to trust and be open to him. Does your family know about him? Uh, the family. Yes, they know. My father and I thought so often about the issue of whether I was insane slash lying slash possessed by Satan was half of what drove me to move out as soon as I was able. It's something that we'll never see eye to eye on, and he drives me insane with his less than subtle hints on if I've met any new guys lately. It's maddening, really. My mother and three younger sisters know, but they won't talk about it with me. I don't think my little sisters believe me, and the one time I actually got to sit down and talk to my mother about my relationship, I made her cry. She said she was sad for me, that I was condemning myself to loneliness, and was depressed that she wouldn't get any grandchildren out of me. I love my mother dearly, and we have a great relationship, but that's the one thing I can't discuss with her or anyone else in my family. Pretty sad, huh, XD? At this point, Julia's visits with Sephiroth on the astral plane were occurring three to four times a week. She began custom crafting jewelry. Of note is this medallion with angel wings. On it is inscribed a rune that she says translates to Sephiroth. She theorized this rune was what tethered Sephiroth to her. The original model was made of clay, but when she started crafting her own jewelry, she created two new medallions that she wore every day. To her, the Sephiroth rune was the evidence that Sephiroth was not a figment of her imagination, but a real entity that she could contact. Also in 2008, her cousin introduced her to Photoshop, which she would use consistently over the years. By 2009, her stream of content had slowed to a trickle. Her posts became farther and farther apart as she shifted away from the online space. She continued to regularly post art and even a few photos from her modeling, while her modeling consists of potentially legitimate compositions, the actual quality of the photos was lost upon upload. As she notes, she artificially enlarged the photographs in Microsoft Paint before posting them to DeviantArt. Even with her frequent post, she abandoned her DeviantArt journal in September, following a rant about Encyclopedia Dramatica. Her blurdy only updated once in the entire year, on December 14th, explaining where her focus had shifted. The Post described her applying for a job at a metaphysical bookstore. After not receiving anything back for two months, one of the store's psychics reached out to her so that they could meet. When I got there, I learned that she works by channeling the Archangel Michael and works closely with the Angelic Realm, which is why it was easy for Sephiroth to contact her. The psychic would teach her the ability to commune with angels in her day-to-day -day life. Over the course of a month, the psychic cleared Julia of the mental block that had stopped her from hearing inaudible sounds. On Friday, December 11th, I was still asleep and I woke up to a cool, tingling sensation on my neck, where Sephiroth frequently kisses me. Then it started happening on my hand. I can't truly explain it, I just knew that it was contact of some kind. And then, I heard his voice telling me to wake up. After four months of effort, finally, I'd opened up to this form of communication. And now, I can speak to him whenever I want. I can feel him touching me. And I no longer feel so alone during my waking life. Words can't describe how happy I am with this development. After December, 
her blurty and deviant art ceased updating, and Julia disappeared from the internet for two years. Julia returned to Blurdy in December 2011. She had taken an extended hiatus to focus on her spiritual development, and at some point had adopted three cats. She had begun pursuing careers as a model, psychic, and martial arts instructor. Her return had come with changes to her belief system. I've spent all this time away, striving still to understand my life. I've been studying privately under a highly respected local psychic. She offered to help me in my inner journey toward understanding my reality and using my gifts as a way to assist others. Honestly, the end of 2011 has left me at yet another total reassessment of everything I believe true of the universe. I think it's about time I just accept that I'll never know all there is to know, not even about myself and why this has happened to me. What does it all mean? All as in everything? What defines reality? Truth be told, I'm not sure I know at all anymore. A lifelong rejection of the notion of past lives and reincarnation is on very, very shaky ground these days. Why? That would be experiences with other psychics. People that I did not know and that did not know me. And people who ended up telling me things that, frankly, no one else could have possibly known. Two encounters in particular stood out. Both were in public classes slash lectures I was attending. I found myself first in a sitting with a medium from out of town. I expected she would identify Sephiroth, of course, as he's always been closest. This medium absolutely floored me as she went around the room, identifying spirits near to the sitter and giving messages to them from those on the other side. As she got to me, as I said, I expected she would identify Sephiroth. I had little reason to think anyone other would step forward, assuming this medium was legitimately talented. But the first thing she said was that it was a woman that wanted to deliver a message to me. She went on to identify a couple of physical traits, her favorite color, and the first letter of her name. The message this spirit wanted to deliver to me was very simple, and that much I can share with all of you. The woman, who will remain anonymous because I've gotten that much smarter, had this to say to me. I love you, I accept you, and I thank you. The other presenter was a past life regression specialist, which caused a crisis for Julia. She was unsure how she felt about reincarnation, but eventually decided that she preferred the concept of an afterlife, stating that eternal damnation was preferable, so long as she did not forget about Sephiroth, but conceded it was possible she and Sephiroth had known each other in a past life. The female spirit identified by the first presenter was only one of Julia's three new spirit guides. My motherly guide is the only female guide I work regularly with. Obviously, her voice stands out as female, and also has a very, very peaceful, calm tone. The teacher guide has a distinctly foreign accent, and his phrasing isn't what we consider typical in America. And the friend guide has a very brash, take-it-or-leave-it sort of attitude. He's outspoken, and generally does not care what you think about his opinion. The three spirits had names, but Julia refused to share them out of respect for their privacy. It has been argued that this is because her three new spirit guides are representative of other Final Fantasy characters, Seng, Reno, and Lucrecia Crescent. Outside of their introduction, nothing else was learned about these new guides, as Julia's focus remained squarely on Sephiroth. It's always been unbelievably difficult for me to see the point of engaging in anything here on Earth. Lacking the support of my family here, and with very, very few friends, my life is lonely here. If I'm not at work, I'm probably home, with three cats for physical company. I found myself asking why I was here at all, being so unhappy here, but content and at peace so long as I was with Sephiroth." She continued to bemoan the treatment from sources such as Encyclopedia Dramatica, but had also found herself at odds with two specific internet users, the original writer of her ED page, Iscariot, and live journal user, Lian Hua. The two had dedicated themselves to sporking Shinra, High, and Soldier. Sporking is the practice of mocking bad fanfiction by re-uploading it with added commentary. Julia had long since denounced her stories as being of, quote, insufficient quality, but seemed to take the sporkings of her writing personally, expressing a wish to meet and possibly fight Iscariot, who she often described as having a primitive mind, and a general annoyance with Lian Hua, who she only vaguely referred to as the female. Almost all of her encounters around 2012 followed this similar pattern, 
starting with Julia stating that she found her dissenters amusing and that she did not care what they said, before she would write paragraph-long rebuttals of her critics. For example, this blurty discussing cyberbullying. I'm emotionally untouchable, inclined either to laugh at my critics, pity them for the life they're squandering, or ponder their motives. But what about other people who have been victims of this phenomena? What effect does such baseless, mindless cruelty, a deliberate attack to bring someone down, have on the 12-year-old kid posting their very first Twilight fanfic online? So all of you, tell me, what makes more sense when critiquing a story? Viciously ripping it to shreds and telling the author to go jump off a bridge? Or being constructive and helpful in your review? No one has ever benefited at all from someone vicious bully who, by the way, doesn't even have published fanfiction or art, telling a fledgling talent that they're terrible and should kill themselves. In the age of social networking we've entered into, superstars are being discovered on YouTube. Success stories like Justin Bieber have sparked a wave of kids and adults, with dreams of stardom are following that trail, hoping to be discovered. Tell me, if you've never sung a note in your life and can't carry a tune in a bucket, as they say, do you have the right to tell that really shy girl with a tiny, meek voice that she's awful, talentless, and should never sing again? Perhaps it would be more prudent to find dreams of your own? On her birthday, she would make an introspective post. Today is my 24th birthday, and at long last, the time has come to make an announcement I should have been prepared to make a long time ago. In the two plus years that I was away, off the internet, working on learning and growing on my spiritual path, one of the things I had to spend a lot of time thinking about was Final Fantasy VII, and how it figured into my future. And I'm finally ready to say that it doesn't. I finally realized this was no longer fun for me. At the point that these games are making me punch holes in things, like the nearest wall, the entertainment value of these games wasn't providing the satisfying escape of something else to focus on. And so, it finally comes time to announce openly. My fascination with Final Fantasy VII served purpose in my life only as a distraction, a convenient escape that I could call on to hide from the pain I was living with in my life. The intricacies of the plot and characters left me never needing to seek another source of distraction I was not prepared to fully face, and live my life such as it is here. I finally made my decision that I will live my life here and fulfill the purpose I was placed here for. Soon after retiring from the Final Fantasy community, Julia would purge her fanfiction.net account of all of its content. This left the sporkings of her work as the only way to read the majority of her writing. It has been this way for a decade. Julia had been an amateur model for a few years, but outside of a few photo shoots, nothing had come from it. Now she was actively trying to make a career of it, with frequent photo shoots and fashion shows. In hopes of gaining notoriety, she created profiles on websites such as Stage 32 and Reality Wanted. She was particularly active on Reality Wanted, often signing up on casting calls, where she would often manage to receive hundreds of votes. Most notably, she posted four audition videos, which no one thought to download. Supposedly, the first two showcased her weapons collection, and the other two were auditions for the US version of the reality television show Big Brother, which she had previously expressed interest in participating in. Her Big Brother audition managed to receive 1,000 votes in favor of her. She said she had signed with a company called Via Entertainment, claiming she only had to work three to four times a month and that she was making $75 an hour. Via Entertainment as a company is commonly agreed to be a scam. Julia's most prominent activity from this time was on DeviantArt, where she would clash in the comments over any criticism leveled at her. Such as her post, The Death of Cloud Strife, featuring a photo of her personally murdering Cloud. She was quick to argue with anyone who questioned her decision to post herself pretending to murder a mannequin. In August, she opened up a short-lived Twitter account, where she would post about her love of reality television, such as Big Brother or Survivor. Despite being set for a resurgence, Sephiroth's slave instead fizzled out. It is unknown when she abandoned Blurdy, as the archives do not go out that far, but it is known that she abandoned her DeviantArt on November 26, effectively retiring the Sephiroth slave persona. Julia's legacy would live on, 
as a prime example of bad fanfiction and delusional fangirls. Discussions of her occasionally pop up on forums, usually brought up in tandem with similar infamous characters. In an unexpected turn of events, author Venetia Robertson would write an academic paper for the Religious Studies Department of the University of Sydney. The paper was published in the book Fiction, Invention, and Hyperreality, From Popular Culture to Religion. Sephiroth's slave is mentioned, though is not the focus of the paper. Encyclopedia Dramatica made some half-hearted attempts to follow her after the shuddering of her deviant art, but quickly lost interest. There are several claims listed on the page that I've not had room to mention, but I would like to cover. So either she was or is employed by Psychic Source, basically a psychic hotline. I wouldn't be able to check without paying actual money to become a member. ED also claims she dropped out of college, an assumption with little basis and most evidence seems to contradict. It also makes a big deal about her burning a doujinshi, presumably a yaoi featuring Sephiroth. It really seems like she was joking and didn't literally burn a doujinshi. Miscariot and Lian Hua ended up finishing their sporking of her two completed novels, as well as pretty much every single body of work Julia ever wrote. Julia rebranded. She still has several active profiles across the internet. While still branding herself as an occult scholar, she makes no reference to a marriage with Sephiroth. She also runs a gameplay channel, fairly consistently uploading gameplay for over half a decade. Her life as Sephiroth's slave is long behind her, Julia has moved on to franchises such as Destiny and Monster Hunter, but seems to have refound a bit of her love for Final Fantasy. Okay.